Good evening, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast, Rewind Edition. I am your host, Jason Miles, and this is where we go take a show from back in the vaults that maybe many of you have never seen before. This is back when we were getting very few views, and then we had under even a thousand subscribers when we did this show with Toure Reed, and I believe it's the first episode with co-host and the first person to hop along the tir crew pascal robert where we take a look at the movie boys in the hood and its relationship to the 1994 crime bill there are two parts to this show um this is part one we'll be airing thank you guys for joining us we were going to do another show today but the brass at TIR said that maybe we might not get the eyeballs that we usually get. So let's do a rewind. One day, maybe I'll put together a bunch of clips and we could do a best of, like like uh, sitcoms that right before they go on hey, just they do like a best of. Maybe we can do a best of bit. Maybe you guys can suggest some moments and I can compile them together as whenever you see me in this room, I'm about to do something um, creative, cut clips, record some new music, maybe do another video essay as we're still trying to get the, the funding to finish this feature length project. There is a shorter one that I have been working on. But thank you guys oh so much for watching the show, for supporting. Let me know what you guys think about this episode. It was done, God, it feels like forever ago. You know, the whole setup was different. I used to stand the entire time doing the show. So this was a good time. Uh, Toure and Pascal, it's always a good time when you get all of us in a, in a room together. Still, one of my favorite episodes is me, Pascal, Toure, and Cedric. I think it was the New Year's Eve episode from this, this same year, and I can't remember the name of that. But please enjoy this episode, Boys in the Hood and the 1994 Crime Bill, and I am out. Hey, 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 hey. Coming at you live all the way from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. This is Revolution live stream. And today I have some very special guests. And apparently people couldn't hear the the uh, the clip. We had some audio issues with the clip. That sucks. I got to fix that. I'm going to fix that right now because that clip is kind of sort of what this show is all about and that is boys in the hood and the 1994 crime bill because i did a show recently with torre and we got on a little bit of a tangent about these movies in this time frame and after that show i went back and i watched boys in the hood serendipity struck and it was on my netflix it said boys in the hood in that strong black lead category right because that's where i watch my movies in the wee hours of the morning and i rewatched boys in the hood and i was like man i knew this movie had some problems but it slaps you in the face in the first scene with the with the black on black crime uh narrative like that's the that's the opening scene one in 23 black men are killed and it's killed in the hands of another black man and 
Therefore, there's no way out other than football. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple things that kind of got to me, and and uh, Pascal, I don't I don't know if you feel the same way. Uh, first of all, why is Trey super hard as a young kid, and he grows up to be oh so soft? <laughs> Yo, that's a really good question. I never, <laughs> never thought about that, but it's really true. And and, and he, ch- he changes his personality and complexion with everything. <laughs> and why does he have the worst hairline in the hood? If you're supposed to have the fly job and you dressing like a thirty year old drug dealer at seventeen, tucking your t shirt into your sweatpants, why do you have the worst hairline? Known the man, and he can't afford to go to the barber shop. He's got the best job, but his dad has to hook up his fade. What does his dad know about a fade? His dad, hoard nothing. His, his dad Larry was Fishburne. wearing a, when his dad was his age. He was wearing an afro. <laughs> his dad <laughs> had white people clippers <laughs> trying to give him a fade in the kitchen. Exactly. Uh oh, Corey, you just sound like Darth Vader possessed you. Your right, audio. Right. I thought we fixed it. I thought we, I thought we fixed that. I, nah. Can you guys hear Tore? Tor, we, we, that's the problem is that we can hear him because it sounds horrible. <laughs> 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 well, well, so let me, let us. me, I'm going to, I'm going to play more of the gentrification clip because this is, this okay, is, okay. we got the audio. Should be working now. Should be working now. Let's get it going. Spoke. Shooting each other and selling We can hear now, right? Crack rock and shit. Well, how you think the crack rock gets into the country? We don't own any planes. We don't own no ships. But we are not the people who are flying and floating that shit in here. I know every time you turn on the TV, that's what you see. Black people selling the rock, pushing the rock, pushing the rock. Yeah, I know. But that wasn't a problem as long as it was here. It wasn't a problem until it was in Iowa, and it showed up on Wall Street where there are hardly any black people. Now, if you want to talk about uh, guns, why is it that there's a gun shop on almost every corner in this community? Why? Tell you why. For the same reason that there's a liquor store on almost every corner in the black community. Why? They want us to kill ourselves. You go out to Beverly Hills, you don't see that shit. But they want us to kill ourselves. Yeah, the best way you can destroy a people, you take away their ability to reproduce themselves. Who is it that's dying out here on these streets every night? Y'all. Young brothers like yourselves. What am I supposed to do? Fool roll up, try to smoke me? You shoot the motherfucker if he don't kill me first. You're doing exactly what they want you to do. You have to think, young brother, about your future. Huh? Damn. 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 It's like it's Malcolm Farrakhan, man. <laughs> <laughs> I watched that scene. Uh, I went to the movies to see Boys in the Hood. So I watched that scene as a very, very young, young man. I was probably 14 years old when I saw that. And I felt like and, and this, is, this is a big reason why I wanted to, to do this show. I felt like that was the discourse for the 90s. And last night, uh, Tere and I, I believe it was last night, um, we're we're talking also about like Sister Soldier. And and I know a lot of people don't remember. I I actually have that clip. We're going to play that a little little later. Sister Soldier was on Phil Donahue, you know, to date myself. I remember that episode. That was like all of the talk, because this is also during the Bill Clinton election the 92 election. And there's an interesting exchange between sister soldier and, uh, and Cornell West. I thought it was interesting because sister soldiers talking about like these evil white people. Right. And, uh, and Cornell West goes, all of them. (laughs) And she's like, yes, all of them. He's like, none of them, none of your teachers. So I looked up Sister Soldier. I like, you know, I, watching that clip, I seriously thought that maybe she was one of these cats that was like, nah, man, I went to JC and I learned all this because somebody took me aside and gave me some knowledgeable books with Kintake print on it. And uh, she went to like Rutgers yeah, and she Cornell. She's pretty well educated. Um, not that she didn't come off 
educated in the clip, but I think she's probably been around a few more white people than she uh, led us to believe. And in searching, so so Torrey also told me that he goes somewhere along there. He's like Stanley Crouch had said something to her, and I'm so I'm over here looking for these Stanley Crouch clips. I can't find it. But again, going deeper down the rabbit hole of '90s <laughs> political discourse of black shit, I'm reading 1992 L.A. Times pieces that that people are writing about these older dudes that don't like hip hop. Mainly Gerald Horn and and Stanley Crouch had a problem with hip hop. They kind of felt it was a bit of a minstrel show. And I saved this quote. This is from Gerald Horn in the L.A. Times in 1993. When Dr. Dre of N.W.A. lives in Calabasas and Ice-T lives in the Hollywood Hills, it's pretty hard to see them as the militant voices of a fighting generation says Gerald Horn, chairman of the Black Studies Department at the time at UC Santa Barbara. When Sister Soldier has a press conference complaining about the interest rates on her certificates of deposit, it's pretty hard to relate to her as a Harriet Tubman. Shots fired! <laughs> Shout out to Gerald Horn on the CD. CD quote. <laughs> I, I don't know how to hook up captions. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to figure it out. So that being said, and, and watching that clip. So I feel like that's still part of the discourse. And I'm by the way, I want you guys, if you can't see this shirt, represent all day. Boys in the hood. Shooters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I feel like that's still kind of part of the black the black discourse. What do you guys think? Uh, I will. I want to. I wanted to quote a friend of mine. It's a comrade of mine. His name is Anthony Ware. He's kind of a brother who has radical politics, and he's from me and Torrey's generation. Torrey and I are two years apart. We're a few years older than you are. I was actually towards my end of the college, my college years when. Uh, Boys in the Hood and Menace came out, and I'm old enough to have been a contemporary of the original hip hop generation. I had older cousins who were DJs in New York. I'm originally from New York City in the late 70s. My brother was, my younger brother was a DJ, my older cousin was a DJ. So, you know, the, the music and its cultural manifestation of things that I saw come alive in my adolescence to teenage years in New York City. But one of my, to shout to quote my friend Anthony Ware, where he talks about the consistent themes of the politics and worldview of this music and these films is his saying is that uh, this, this art form demonstrates that black power succeeded culturally where it failed politically. And that the discourse and the rhetoric about notions of quote unquote racial politics and racial empowerment that became you know, resplendent during the black power era that one of the ways in that it kind of reifies itself and it maintains its continu continuum is through hip hop music. And being a child of New York City, it doesn't surprise me that this happens because of the way in which black nationalism is, is kind of uh, a part of the cultural ethos of New York City in the late 70s and the 80s as well. Though I will concede brothers like Cedric and even Torrey have argued with me that Chicago by far is more of a black nationalist bastion than New York City. What, what I think one aspect of the popular culture that comes around hip hop, particularly when you're talking about that scene about gentrification, that kind of sounds like something you might hear from a combination of like, you know, the Nation of Islam or KRS one or Public Enemy, depending on what day it is, day of the week it is, is that the cultural continuity of this kind of combination of black nationalism, whether it's revolutionary or not, but it's definitely kind of nationalist political discourse, it's maintained consistent within the music and the message. Now, some people will say, well, that's a good thing, right? But the thing is, though, is that some people would fail to uh, consider what exactly is the ultimate uh, result of that black nationalist project 
if it doesn't engage one in criticizing the institutional mechanisms like maybe capitalism, like maybe deindustrialization, mm. like the effects of neoliberalism mm. on black life in that area, instead of saying black people are defective. Damn. So that actually kind of watching that clip, that's exactly what I felt. And then going back and even listening to Sister Soldier. So that also sent me down another rabbit hole of watching a Morty, Morton Downey Jr. documentary. <laughs> which, which Jason and I were talking about today. You can hear me now, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you sound yeah. great. You sound great. Cool. Yeah. So I think, Torre, you have to chime in on this. Tag team. Oh, we were just talking about, um, I mean, this isn't that interesting, though, is it? Um, we were talking about watching Morton Downey Jr. For me on Channel 9 out of Secaucus uh, for Jason. What channel was it for you out there? Like 24 or something like yeah. that, 23. And I used to watch it, um, I guess, when I was in high school. And my father gave me shit about it because, it, because for me, it was fascinating because I thought it was so over the top. It was like pro wrestling. Nobody could possibly believe this crazy stuff, right? And my pop said, you know, that I admonished me uh, to, to be straightforward about it uh, and told me I was being naive, essentially, but in more colorful language. And uh, when I switched schools and went to high school with a bunch of Morton Downey Jr. fans, I realized that that my father was 100 percent right, <laughs> that I was naive. People really did believe it. And, um, you know, that was the original era of making America great again as episode two of Showtime's Reagan documentary, I guess, concludes or nearly concludes with Reagan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, making that very statement. But but those were crazy times. I mean, just to take it back to what Pascal was talking about, though, with respect to those hood films, um, and I thought Pascal touched on all the major points, but one of the things that jumped out at me about those films at the time, I think two of which I saw in the theater, three, if we count, don't be a menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the in the hood. But I saw that that okay. Count. Then I saw three. <laughs> so I saw Colors, which came out when I was in high school, and then I saw Boys in the Hood uh, in, in the theater. But but the recurring theme of underclass ideology that was driving those narratives, as Pascal said, brushes aside all of the the sources of inequality that afflict the hood. Uh, it takes them for granted, and instead, all one gets is these kind of is the self perpetuating culture of dependency uh, and poverty, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and those films, I think, really correspond with, or at least take the same kind of framework. They perceive from the same kind of framework as you and I had talked about before, Jason and Pascal talked, and I talked about this years ago, that those supposedly anti-Vietnam War films from the 70s and the first half of the 80s that I grew up on that were anything but anti-Vietnam War. They were they were anti-conscription. That's what they were. But, but they weren't anti-Vietnam War. And they couldn't be because those films, those Vietnam War films like The Deer Hunter, um, Apocalypse Now, uh, Hamburger Hill, etc. They had a squad's eye view of the war, mm -hmm. and the only anti-war theme that pervaded them really was sort of teenage alienation, uh, and uh, you know people in D.C. not really understanding what's going on, what the real war was about, right in the jungle. And you can transition seamlessly from those themes uh, that that drove those anti-war films, those so-called anti-war films of the 70s and 80s, and apply them to the hood films. It's the same basic problem. And in both cases, you get no sense of what the broader forces are. And in each case, you actually end up with sympathetic views, I guess, maybe, if you're lucky, uh, of, of, the, of the principal characters, at least the stratum of the the principal characters, but you walk away with the reactionary lesson, uh, and the reactionary lesson from those Vietnam War films was all the wars that we've been fighting. The military should be, you know, volunteer rather than conscript. More special forces, more specialized weaponry. You know, smart bombing rather than carpet bombing, and um, 
but the <laughs> war was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then, of course, uh, in the hood films, the problem really comes down to underclass things, which would be the culture of poverty. Uh, if people don't know what underclass ideology is, it's it's essentially an update of the cult culture of poverty. So what are the fixes? Um, the fixes from the John Singleton films, and I think this actually highlights the trajectory of, of Trey's hard to soft character, um, would be to have more black men raise their sons uh, and re welfare reform, basically. I, I think those are the fixes that were that that came through in those films i definitely felt the uh the, the black man raise your son uh theme which is still a theme i mean were we just yelling at bill cosby about saying that like eight <laughs> years ago yeah well, the thing is though when you say black man raise your son besides the mythology of believing people that people believing that black men abandoned their family because welfare made them obsolete in the household, no one asked the fact that maybe the reason black men were leaving their families is because they were not able to find competitive jobs because there was no more union work in the inner city that they were living anymore. And you know they were basically being re rendered to redundant labor because the workforce had no space for them. And not to mention that the only competitive economy that we start to see in the post-civil rights era becomes the heroin trade, which manifests later on into the crack trade and so on and so forth. So we always try to find these kind of short-term solutions for what exactly is causing the lack of presence of black men in the family, but it's never tied to political economy. Instead, we have these reactionary responses where it's like, oh, it was the welfare that took the black men out of the family. And the question then becomes, and then you know, why is it that we're seeing these precipitously increasing rates of single parenthood amongst white folk who are on welfare as well. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. problem then becomes that this is not simply a black pathology. This is tied to the political economy in which African-Americans are entering uh, you know, American capitalism in the post-civil rights era, era where there's no functional mechanism like you know the National Labor Relations Board or the expansion of union jobs or the expansion of industrial labor or the expansion of, of you know the work projects administration to give them the kind of quality you know middle class lifestyle that was able to you know propel large numbers of urban white ethnics into the middle class in disproportionate in disproportionate numbers and as a result we start to see the social dislocation that affects uh, black families to a large degree. But again, one of the consequences of these kind of reductionist kind of black, black nationalist kind of black power explanations is that this is something that the man did to us without mm -hmm. indicting the way in which capitalism displaced the function mm -hmm. of black labor in American society. Well, let me just add something to what Pascal said or amplify it. Um, Pascal's last point I think was the characterization or the insistence that this is this is what the man did to us. And as he said um, in his nicely articulated historical sweep, that uh, what comes through in the film is welfare dependency, right? And that becomes evidence again of the you know excesses of liberalism, which actually complement the Reagan administration and other other conservatives take on uh, critique of of the welfare state and the Johnson administration's war on poverty more directly. But of course, from the nationalist perspective, which is what's fueling these films as racial nationalist perspective, it's not before there was welfare, there was slavery. And oftentimes when Americans think of, or in, and I should say black Americans, uh, sadly, think of black American history, um, it basically comes down to slavery and most people don't seem to know the difference between slavery and Jim Crow. So those two get collapsed into each other. So slavery, mm -hmm. uh, then slavery ends and then nothing happens in black life until a tired seamstress refused to give up her seat on the bus, <laughs> uh, which we know is, is a myth, right? So, but there's nothing basically between 1865 or 1877, if you're a little more sophisticated, uh, and the middle 1950s. And of course, that paves the way for an exceptionalist account of Black history, which is what Pascal was talking about, uh, that I think is oddly susceptible, is uniquely susceptible to these kinds of reactionary frameworks. And, and actually saying it's susceptible probably gives it too much credit. And often, oftentimes, 
uh, it's not simply that that narrative, that pat narrative, uh, leaves one vulnerable to charlatans. Oftentimes, what's going on is that you know racial nationalists, no matter their race, are conservative. So, look, I would say by definition. So, what you get is baked in to these narratives um, a disposition to treat societal problems as individual problems, which is the second point that I wanted to amplify that Pascal said. So Pascal had mentioned the kind of short term um, solutions that you get here. And I would, would tease that out just a little bit. Um, the solutions that come through in these films are anti-status. They're all self-help, right? It's all yeah. do for self narratives. Very, very, very bootstrapping. Very, very bootstrapping. And the gentrification scene. Uh, which I didn't get to to hear, but I have seen the film in the last I can replay eighteen months. You, uh, you know, I I could probably live the rest of my life being happy not hearing it again. Not hearing but, it again. But I possibly, I actually do have to watch it again though. But for personal reasons, but the gentrification scene is you know lays it out pretty nicely, or or Fishburne's line in that. Interestingly enough, uh, John Singleton had an attachment to Larry Fishburne as the didactic voice of reason because if you i know higher learning doesn't fit in this but mm -hmm. but larry fishburne plays a uh, west indian uh professor in higher learning very conservative west indian professor. absolutely what is higher Who is, what which is, is with the the voice of reason right too right he's mm -hmm. very conservative he's the voice of reason and he did some shit i would never do as a professor right if i recall correctly he called out students who were who had failed to make their first tuition payment or something right? <laughs> uh, and a kind of like in front of everybody right and a we don't get that kind of information i mean i never got that kind of information and b if i did i wouldn't share it like that right um but anyway you colored people <laughs> not paying your tuition Buyaka. <laughs> Uh, I went to the movie theater to see Higher Learning, and I remember even as a kid, like we were all fired up. And and anyone that's watching this that remembers going to the theater, there was like different theaters you had to go to where I'm from. And I don't know if you guys from the same place. It's like there's the white theater where you're going to be OK. They might get loud, but you'll be OK. And then there was like the hood theater where you people might get fucked up in any black movie that was coming out in the 90s. That was like the hot thing to do. And I felt like it was all over the country, too. There was like a lot of stories I would read about where there was outbreaks of violence. And so I remember we went to the the good theater to go see Higher Learning. And we all walked out of there kind of disappointed. Because I think sense. we we I think we projected onto that movie and all those movies more than it really was. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. Boys in the Hood came out like you couldn't escape boys in the hood in in hip-hop press because it was it was ice cube i can't remember another movie where there was a a, 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 a rapper actor colors was i color ice t was was ice t in, in colors he did he did the song was he in it i thought he was but you know i he's haven't in, he's seen in that one since 1988 yeah, but that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, that doesn't count. Like, I think that was the first oh, movie where we have a rapper. Actually. Rico Suave. The Rico Suave dude was in Colors. Rico Suave was in... If that counts. Anyone? He was in anyone Colors. Know? He was in Colors. But did, do you know what he was in before that? <laughs> no. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Anyone? <laughs> Can't Buy Me Love. Oh. He was one of the that. bullies. I he was one of the bullies that, one. that wore That's the funny. half shirt. And can't buy me love. Y'all watching a lot of old bad movies all over again. Hey, <laughs> all day. We have long talks about watching <laughs> shitty films, especially horror. <laughs> I do. I watch bad, horror, but I really, I really can get down on some bad eighty cinema. But I've been for this show. I definitely kind of immersed myself back into that time of like, okay. It's, I'm 14. Someone just gave me stolen legacy, and I'm <laughs> fine, you know, like, see, look, I fucked up. <laughs> oh man, right? But I mean, hey, this is that's that time. And then this young lady started to speak, and she just took up a lot of oxygen for like two months. So I'm gonna play the sister soldier clip because I'd have to play. I won't play the whole thing. I'll save you guys that. 
programs. In all of the programs that I attended, all of the education that I had, college, public, and otherwise, nobody ever told me that I was an African woman. Here. Nobody yeah. ever told me what the history of African people were. Nobody ever told me that America is business and without business you will have nothing and be nothing. And nobody ever told me how to organize business so that I would be able to develop institutions in my own community. So now the sincerity the sincerity of all of the programs and all of the education has to be questioned, indicted, and convicted because the bottom line is that America is not and has never tried to produce African adults who are functional, self-sufficient, who understand their politics, their economics, and their relationship to the world politics and the world economics. Americans identified with the NAACP, the Urban League, and the traditional We, co we Shall Overcome Neo uh, civil rights Neo leaders of the 50s and 60s yes, no, that Negro. have been all but abandoned and ignored yeah. by younger people, sister soldier yeah. included. Man, I, man, I, man, think man, that, I think that the dice are loaded, and that's what's left out of Mr. Brown's piece. Mm -hmm. See, there was a period of time in this country after uh, uh, re Reconstruction where African people owned a lot of land, owned a lot of businesses, and did a lot of things. But what happened was the American government, the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, other organizations organized in smashing that effort. So it's not that we haven't tried to own lands and have not organized yeah. businesses. It's that if you are African in America or in Latin America or in the Caribbean or in the continent, you will be hunted no matter what you do because they do not want us to survive and become self-sufficient. Well, and you can say no, but you haven't lived this life. You haven't lived this life. I think that they want to be happy. We want food. I'm talking about that. All right. Now, to paraphrase Senator Bradley of New Jersey, the state from which you your piece was. Senator Bradley gets much right when he talks. Oh, yeah, he does. And he among other things, and he's not claiming to be particularly original with the observation, we can't get there unless we go together. I have a terrible feeling that behind me are some people who do not agree. Senator Bradley of the all-white United States Senate said, we can't get there unless we all go there together. Sorry, none of us are where he is. That's number one. Number two, you're making an, a moral appeal mm -hmm. to a country that doesn't have a moral conscience. Right. The question becomes that when white people feel serious and angry and upset about abortion, they come out in the thousands up to the millions to say, this is what we believe about abortion. Where is the white outcry against white racism that murders African people all around this entire globe? It doesn't exist. So who are these white good people? I want to meet them. I want to I see know them. I, will, I, I know feel it's not enough. But that's why, that, that, that might be all we can get. I feel, no, no, and guess what? I don't work with all I can get. Yes. What I work with is what, what I have. Listen, you have to have some confidence yes. in the power of African people amongst ourselves to establish a foundation. We have. I mean, no, we have. We have, we have utter chaos in our cities, and you've got There's to no say that. We you can have a program. I Say, I'm not saying we've built a lot of institutions, sure. and those institutions have not been effective. The majority of millions of African youth in this country they, are dying mentally, dying spiritually, dying emotionally, dying academically. I and you may have a program, Mr. Brown may have a program, but what we got to talk about is an American government that tracks millions of African people who don't go to your program, don't go to Brown's program, millions of African people. Not only here, but all around the world. And if we are not honest enough to say who are our friends, who are our enemies, to know what a friend is, to know what an enemy is, we will constantly be trying to get into people's parties, to shake our butts with them, to get them to like us. And that's not the question. The question is, what can we build amongst ourselves to secure ourselves from our enemies so that we will be able to survive into the future? So that's, that's all I'm going to play from that because... She's just too hyphy. Uh, well, I mean, I, I really want to address this for a lot of reasons. Number one, <laughs> I, I really, I really do, because because what's fascinating about what Sister Soldier is saying, right, is that it neglects a very important aspect of Black political history, and that is 
what exactly happened when we tried to do this same thing in 1972. And this is a theme that I text back and forth with Toy all the time is that I love in 2020 watching black people talk about black politics like it's 1972. And when I say 1972, <laughs> the, you know, the Gary Convention, the black agenda, we need a black agenda, so on and so forth. What happens when we have those politics is that we actually do get self-determination. Why don't, why is, is the black political class a different part of black people? So when I hear people say we need self-determination, we need to control our own politics, we need to control our institutions. So the over 10,000 black members of the black political class who have basically been slapping it off black political energy into the neoliberal agenda for over 45 years, they're not determining for, I mean, are they part of the self or not part of the self? So what, what is fascinating about this kind of discourse is that all the white people are bad and all the black people are good, except for the 45 years of having black political officials help facilitate things like mass incarceration, gentrification, mm -hmm. and every other ailment that has affected black people. And it reduces black politics into this kind of mannequin. It's us against a white man, which is just like black politics in 1972. And what the black politics of 1972 got us was the advent of the black political class. And what this type of, you know, race reduction, as historian would call it, politics will get us, is what it always gets us. It gets a political agenda that becomes a wealth transfer to the black political class and the black middle class, while the black poor working class gets ground to powder. As I like to pejoratively, pejoratively call it, it's fat back and biscuits for the black elite, while the black masses get ground to dust. Damn. To call the show Fat Back and Biscuits. I wish we would have had this conversation. <laughs> that's that's like perfect. <laughs> so Ray, do you have do you have uh something you want to chime in and say? Or were you just watching that going, man, I wish I was at that shit? <laughs> Cause Cor well, what did you think of a young Cornell West just well, kind of letting her go? I, I was amused by that. There are a number of things that were amusing to me about it, but it I'd forgotten that Cornell was that young. I was <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it happens to all of us, right? So uh that, been, that was amazing. Been 50 for like the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, so I I was struck by, and I think Pascal had made a veiled reference to this, the line that you that Sister Soldier ran, which again is completely in step with the voice of reason in um, uh, Boys in the Hood, Larry Fishburne's character, um, that what she had not been taught as a young person was that in America, uh, business is everything, I'm paraphrasing, and without business, you have nothing. And what's interesting about that in keeping again with with uh, what's his face from Boys in the Hood, Larry Fishburne's character in Boys in the Hood, but Pascal's point, uh, as well about black self-determination is that on some level, what Sister Soldier was advocating was Bookerism. I mean, by which I mean Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. uh, with much more militancy. And that's a recurring theme in most of the, the mainstream uh, black nationalist movements that would follow Washington from Garvey forward, that it's still basically Bookerism, but with the addendum that white people suck. And that, <laughs> <laughs> that addendum that white people suck matters because it, it certainly obscures the fundamental conservatism of the Bookerite project, which is obviously, as Sister Soldier says, racial self-determination. But on some level, the racial self-determination project gives white people too much credit. I mean, because it presumes that white people band together in common cause over issues and, and aren't divided, of course, by political um, differences and the like, right? I mean, she makes the abortion analogy that white people get together, millions, thousands, whatever, uh, white people get together in support of abortion rights. But she says, um, where are these well-meaning white people coming together? Why don't they come together in the thousands in defense of black lives? And of course, what happened fast forward to the summer of 2020? but we've seen what it means for white people, well-meaning liberal whites to come together in defense of black lives. And those actions are of course, as much as anything else, often enough symbolic 
more symbolic than they are substantive. The main point, though, which is, I mean, because that's just an aside, the contention that blacks share a common interest, and for her, the corollary is that whites share a common interest. I think any black person with a large extended family even knows how problematic that framework is. Um, I have a relatively large family and I love all my cousins. I really do. I think they're all great, but we don't all share the same sensibilities of values despite being black and being relatives, right? Um, the fact of the matter is, again, if you've gone to schools with that were predominantly black, uh, growing up in communities that were predominantly black, your life experience tells you that black people don't all share the same interests. And the fact that we don't isn't illustrative of the psychological damage that's inflicted upon us by slavery. It's illustrative of the fact that we're human beings rather than bees. Uh, the fact of the matter is there are more black Americans than there are people in Canada. I think there's like 42 million blacks in the United States and there's like 38 million Canadians. It should be no surprise that we're heterogeneous and that we, as with respect to our politics, values and, and assumptions about the world, uh, which militates against the kind of collective project that she puts forth. And I'm gonna say this one more time, white people didn't get ahead because they pooled their resources and all share at the same end. The As Pascal had alluded to, um, I think with his initial salvo, the genesis of the white, the expansion of the white middle class of lore isn't owed to you know the values of the Scots, Irish, Italian Americans, Jews, Polish Americans, et cetera. It's owed to the New Deal welfare state. It's owed to the post-war uh, welfare state and post-war economic growth uh, that blacks benefited from, but not to the same extent as whites, right? So the, the centrality of the state, as Pascal said, uh, to the story of group ascendancy mm -hmm. uh, is, is obscured actually by a narrative centered on group ascendancy. It's, I'd like to interject. Okay. I'd like to interject to uh, di digress into a, a documentary that both Tori, Tori and I have been watching, which is the Showtime documentary on Ronald Reagan, which I think is very good. If you could suggest to your, uh, I love it to your love uh, it. to your audience to watch it. But one of the things that I had texted to Tori that I found fascinating is that you know Ron Reagan's po adult political career is premised on him basically saying that government is not the solution, government is the problem. But this guy's whole life from his childhood where his father and brother are getting jobs because of the New Deal to the fact that his first acting job is doing government films for war propaganda, how his whole early life, as well as the generation of Republican politicians that he represents that spent the, you know, the, from the 60s to the post-civil rights era to the advent of neoliberalism in the 80s, arguing against government largesse from the guys who were the beneficiaries to the GI Bill, like Thomas Sowell, who were the beneficiary of the Fair, beneficiary of the Fair Housing Act and all that stuff. All of these men were lifted into stable, middle, upper middle class quality of life from government largesse, yet they spend their political capital as adults talking about how the government can't work and they use race politics and black people as a political uh, kind of pinata to argue particularly as to why that kind of politics cannot be expended. And what is fascinating in terms of tying that into Sister Soldier's kind of bookerism as Torre so eloquently explains or, or self-help kind of nationalism is that it completely denies the reality that it was it has been the government and the state going back to the Homestead Act and from the 19th to the 20th century that has always been able to uh, facilitate the growth of, of, of the white middle class. Yet for some reason, uh, many of our bro brothers and sisters who are nationalists or who fetishize black power believe that black folks should go it alone and do it on their own, on themselves, because if we don't, we're defective and we're lazy. And that's something that very few people are challenging. Well, and now, of course, uh, with the aid of Tony C. Coates, I think many black nationalists have come to understand the role of the welfare state in a more explicit way anyway, but are drawing not the best lessons, we could say, from it, if, if not 
the wrong lessons. By the way, I want to add one other thing to Pascal's observations about Reagan, and we should probably get back to that that thing I just said though. Um, after Reagan, you know, become is, as, as a young man, as Pascal said, Reagan was a beneficiary of federal largesse uh, by way of the New Deal and, of course, his uh, wartime propaganda efforts. But what's also no less interesting is that, um, by the way, comment to the reference, Pascal, your biscuits thing was a hit. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I just saw that it made me laugh. Anyway, after that, he was on the dime of rich benefactors too, right? After his acting career um, starts to tank or at least decline a bit, he was the 100% full on, he was like the max headroom back before there was a max headroom of GE. He was the mm -hmm. permanent live-in He show. had the GE house. He had right, the, I mean, that's crazy. State-of-the-art GE house, yeah. And he goes from that to you know being uh, the guy who is made by the kingmakers, but he's on the kingmakers dime. Right. Uh, so when he wasn't on the state's dime, he, he certainly had an acting career that was independent of, of propaganda. But then he transitions from that to being on the dime of corporate interest and ultimately makes his mate makes his wealth uh, as their pitch man. And then, of course, that becomes the basis for his political career. It, it's really quite fascinating and disturbing. <laughs> If you put all that together, well, there, there's kind of been like a little theme for a lot of these things I've been watching because I watched uh, Torre actually had mentioned the Reagan thing to me the other day to uh, Pascal. And then uh, I watched the Reagan thing. I was up late as fuck. Real talk. <laughs> uh, I watched the Reagan thing. I watched the Morton Downey thing. And I'm like, you know, th these guys both start out as Democrats. Right. Morton Downey Jr. grew up next to the Kennedys. His dad is known as the first recording artist. And for those that don't know who Morton Downey Jr. is, they're, they're, I'm sure there's young people that that uh, weren't around, but he was only on for like a year. Predator he, 2. Don't forget Predator 2. Was he, he was in Predator that. 2? He, he was, was in that Tales from the Crypt. That's the only thing he I was. remember him being in. That and Predator 2. He was in Predator 2? He was. He was like a cheesy Maury Povich before Maury came around. He was like a talk show he, host. And he was like worse than that. Yeah, he was worse than <laughs> he, but more. Yeah, that's a good. He, he was he was the guy that started the fighting on stage. Yeah, and go find a maybe I'll I'll I, I'll cue the clip of of uh, Al Sharpton getting Al Sharpton and Quaid and and Ralph Roy Innes. Roy Innes, sorry, yeah, Roy Innes fighting the Tawana Barley. That, yeah, we don't want to go down that that hole. But watching these guys kind of play a role ultimately and that's how they made their their fame they pretended to be reactionary republicans to a very disenfranchised populace and no, i don't think they pretended they were reactionary because they didn't want they they believed wholeheartedly that the largesse that they were the beneficiary of mm -hmm. should not go unfortunately to black people a lot of them believed that uh, or they believed that they didn't want to pay for it if it was going to benefit Black people, white. In other words, they didn't want to be taxed. Yeah, more. yeah, I agree with that. And Morton Downey really doubled down on that rhetoric. Like he was watching that documentary, I was like, dude, he was to the right of of Ron Paul. <laughs> like he was, he was so far right, but had such a young audience too. It was, it was really interesting to see, and this is all going on in Reagan's America. Or I guess it's towards the end of his last term, but it's still Reagan's America where this is this is happening. So watching the Reagan documentary, watching all these fucking hood movies, and I feel like they all just they, none of it has any sort of talk at all about anything you guys said, especially when it comes to deindustrialization. And I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. There's something I wanted to talk about that I really want us to spend some time on if we can, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. We can Is that uh, in the wake of kind of like uh, uh, Sister Soldier's kind of like, you know, uh, racial mow mowing of the system in that video, talking about, you know, I never got this, I never got anyone to teach me a business, but yet no one talks about the fact that she is a beneficiary 
of the hyper-capitalization of Black popular culture that starts in the 80s that allows her to tour with what would become a multi-million dollar rap group called Public Enemy. And no one inter interrogates, well, how much money was she able to facilitate in the utility of capitalism that you know existed at that time, being that she didn't seem to have all this tutelage and benefit from this hyper-capitalization of Black popular culture. And there seems to be very little interrogation of what was the consequence, right, politically, socially, and culturally, and the legacy of the hyper-capitalization of Black popular culture that starts in the 80s, not only in terms of music and art, but in sports, the rise of the million-dollar sports figure, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, the rise, you know, Magic Johnson. You know, like there's a certain phenomenon that happens with Black popular cultural production in the 80s, which is a period of massive political retrenchment away from policy that's public goods oriented and um, greater, greater uh, emphasis on privatization of resources. But yet at the same time, right, Black popular culture is capitalized in a way that you never saw before. You know, Spike Lee was getting budgets for his movies in the 80s that Black exploitation movies were not getting in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And what exactly, mm -hmm. and what I see particularly with the politics that we've evolved in today, with the rise of kind of like, you know, cat rappers talking about the black agenda and Ice Cube, how he's morphed from Doughboy to now being the new black leader of the day. So, is that <laughs> I'm seeing the consequence of that hyper capitalization that started in my teens and early 20s and how it continues through the 90s to the arts of today. And there's no interrogation in terms of, not only how that affects black political thought, but the social, a complete social interrogation in terms of how that affects the way black people view themselves relative to the rest of, the rest of society and overall. Well, well did you, you, can, you can add that that um, that the place of the the larger place of black culture or black popular culture uh, on a national platform probably it would be fair to say dates back to the seventies with disco. Uh, right. And there's an explosion of sitcoms, some of which my parents wouldn't let me watch, uh, like Baby on Back. I couldn't watch, I believe. Right. Uh, <laughs> but a host of others, Sanford and Son, which is great. Watch that one all the time. Uh, the Jeffersons and all that stuff. And I think given our proximity and age, uh, Pascal, and uh, proximity geographically in a tri-state area, it was my experience when I moved to, to Connecticut that a lot of my white peers thought they knew black people from TV, right? I mean, from the yes. TV of the 1970s. And then it's a gentle segue from, you know, Jimmy J.J. Walker, <laughs> let's say, uh, and and Wallona and Florida um, to, you know, ultimately run DMC, right? Well, you said something uh, very interesting. And <laughs> let's tie in that rise of black popular uh, production in the 70s to the Christmas. Right oh, to the yeah. to the Kerner Commission sure. report because let's not forget and I wrote a piece about this in Black Agenda Report about Clarence Avant. I talked about how Clarence Avant, who was this kind of uh, race broker for Black entertainers in the '70s, basically comes of age where in the Kerner Commission report after the riots, you know, uh, Johnson issues a study and he's basically like, well, how do we get these people to stop rioting again? And one of the chapters, he's like, flood them with TV shows, put them more, let, let's, let's see more of them on TV. Let's see more of them entertaining. As a matter of fact, one of the quotes in, in, in the Credit Commission report is like, let's have shows that demonstrate life in the ghetto, i.e. like good times, you know? So this kind of becomes a mechanism of demobilization that, I'm not going to I'm not trying to be conspiratorial and say that this motivation continues into the 80s, but the larger point is, is that those shows proliferate and they become much more kind of fused with you know more wealth and more money. And you we see more independent productions. And now I think that we've come to a point where black popular culture is almost like definitive of how people view themselves in a way that I think is. I mean, I, I think it's always had a role in from the 20th century to today, but I think it's its role is more consistent and more unchallenged in a way that I think some, is somewhat yeah. disturbing. Well, especially yeah. since, just to hammer away at one of your, your points, or at least the subtext of one of your points, that by between the 80s and 2000s, what Black popular culture is going to be, uh, certainly by this point, is Reaganism. 
basically, right? With splish splash of racial militancy, depending on who you're talking about. But but sadly, uh, Reaganism, as I put it to a, a buddy of mine recently, with ass shaking, right? I mean, mm-hmm. because there's so much celebration of of accumulation of wealth, right, of acquisitiveness with no regard for the public consequences of it. Was it Biggie's Juicy? Remember that? Um, Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to Biggie's Juicy, which came out, was it 94 or five or something like that? Um, Mid 90s, mid 90s. And after I lived in in Holly Grove in New Orleans in 1993, and open and Holly Grove in New Orleans in 1993 was kind of rough. Uh, there was an active drug trade in the in the area, and uh, I often felt kind of funny driving home, tipsy, uh, which you should always feel funny driving home tipsy. By the way, which I would never do at this stage in my life, but I certainly did when I was you know 22, um, you know, at three o'clock in the morning in the neighborhood. But anyway, um, that opens, if I remember correctly with Biggie telling everybody, the teachers had told him he wouldn't amount to anything. And of course, um, the people in the neighborhood who called the cops on him when he was slinging just to take care of his family. It opens with that line. I remember thinking when I heard that line, well, I get the fact that you were slinging to take care of your family, but these people are trying to take care of their family too. And um, if you lived in a community with an active drug trade in that era or this era, uh, there, there were these drive-bys and uh, the like where innocent people who weren't in the game were killed and they had reasonable concerns about their safety. But, but anyway, the point that I'm making uh, that is fundamentally that the genre basically sells, much like these hood films, Reaganism to black people. Um, the hood films sell underclass ideology to black people. They encourage black people to see themselves as the problem rather than these things that passed, these issues that Pascal pointed to related to American political economy, like the deindustrialization, the decline of the union movement, public sector retrenchment. And of course, the rap game uh, at a certain point uh, by the 1990s at the latest begins to sell Reaganism in the form of entrepreneurialism, right? Because that's what drug dealers are. They're entrepreneurs who operate ideally in a deregulated society where they get to do whatever they want uh, to make that money with no regard for the broader consequences. So you're saying drug dealers are like the fossil fuel industry. (laughs) Is that what we're getting at here? Well, but I mean, you have a better time probably after (laughs) after you buy some drugs and some gas. Unless you're buying gas to fill your car up to go to the drug dealer. Drugs. There. Uh, I mean, the thing is, though, right? I think, like, you know, for Tori and I, who are clearly like Generation X black black men, right? Who were like, you know, would be considered the old, the old beards of the black community, Mm -hmm. which is probably horrifying to both of us for a variety of reasons, right? It's like, you know, you know, we don't want to turn into that guy. In other words, we don't want to right. be the cartoonist Stanley Crouch. See, it's that hip hop, damn it, that destroyed a whole generation of black kids. That did. That's a pretty good impersonation because I had to watch <laughs> a bunch of his video. Because it's, it's <laughs> only the bad hip hop, though. It's only, it's the, only bad. the bad. But the thing is, though, <laughs> like what, what the consequence of not interrogating right. how pop culture works in a system to validate a policy and a political economy that is worked on not only disadvantaging all black, all people, but particularly black people because we have such a larger percentage of black people who are in a stage of precarity allows us to come to a point where we can't have critical conversations without being deemed either reactionary or yeah. sellout. And I can I say, listen, it's not, listen my, my, my credentials in terms of the origins of hip hop growing up in Jamaican Queens are on, you know, are not going to be questioned by anyone in terms of understanding, liking the best of the music, and understanding what the music is about. But the larger point is that, you know, we, at a certain point, can we have an intellectual conversation about what exactly this project produces in terms of political and social and economic consequence for the communities that consume this product? Or the community, or the people who consume it and make judgments about the communities that appear in this product. Right. 
Well, and that's the last point you made is is key, though, right? That the genre has not been a black art form, I would say, since the genesis of Yo! MTV Raps, but which I think was like 87 or 88 or something. 88. Like that. I mean, so it, it crossed over when gangster rap was all the rage in the early 1990s. One of the things that disturbed me about the genre is that more than 50 percent of of the consumers of the genre were white kids. Mm-hmm. And by this point, I'm in college surrounded by affluent white kids, many of them, you know, hippies or the precursor to hipsters and watching them, much like my high school uh, acquaintances, consume that genre uh, with an eye toward getting a window onto the true black experience, right? Because that, that's what happened, was sobering for me because for them, on some level, uh, rap was the minstrel show, or at least I won't say the, the entirety of the genre, right? The native tongue posse uh, was great, uh, of course, and was popular, it seemed, among a stratum of college kids across racial lines. But gangster rap in particular, for a lot of young people when Pascal and I were young people, for a lot of young white people, I should say, when Pascal and I were young young men, uh, was a window onto what they believed to be the authentic black experience, but it was essentially a minstrel show. But also, too, don't you feel like there were... I feel like the journalism of that time kept spitting out that narrative that this is the real experience Absolutely. Right here. If you want to know what black life is, and and I think it's worse now. Like I don't, I, I know we don't really know each other, uh, Pascal, but I work in, in well, I did work in music festivals, mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't, I'm an old, I'm a little younger than y'all, but I just have, I'm like an old fuddy duddy, and there's a lot of shit I hate. And usually when I work these music festivals, I'm like yelling at people, put the clothes on, and turn the shit down. <laughs> Like I am that guy. I'm I'm John Witherspoon and House Party uh, at Coachella, but but I worked the, these hip hop ones too, and I worked one called Rolling Loud, and it's it was a hip hop festival, and it was it was very very what they call them the mumble rappers, mm. and uh, <laughs> if you want to talk about a minstrel show. <laughs> Like they weren't hiding it. And then, but if you read the reviews in like Complex Magazine, and I've hung out with writers of Complex Magazine, they don't look like us. Well, was it the, was it Vibe or the source that was, I think it was Vibe that was founded by two Harvard white, uh, two, two white no, Harvard white. Was it the source? It was the source. It's um, not and- Ben Vino? <laughs> I thought Ben Zeno founded the source. No, but I think it's. Uh, but the thing is, though, I want I want to interject something important, right? Back to I that. I hope it's important. Journalism. You're interjecting. I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> How about the generation of general of journalists who are saying that hip hop is contribution to the Black Liberation Struggle trademark Incorporated LLC? If you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it. It's really interesting to be in that world, right? Like in it. I'm in it backstage, side stage, in it. And you're just like, I can't take any of y'all seriously. I want to hear Torrey speak because I cut him off and I feel bad. He's going to accuse me. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. I was not speaking. I don't feel bad speaking. at all. I was afraid it was going to be Torrey and Cedric. Now it's going to be too many light skinned people on, on the internet. <laughs> I was like, I got to have a, a limit of, of light skinned people. And when Torrey's like, I got a homie, I was like, is he light? <laughs> <laughs> I got a paper bag test the people before they get on. The- <laughs> That's bad, bro. <laughs> but go That's ahead funny. and finish, Torrey. I was good. I wasn't even saying anything. It was all Pascal. <laughs> no, but I, I really, uh, you know, I'm glad that you know we can we can commiserate about our you know positions on hip hop. And I mean, I'm just you know, it's very easy to become dismissed by you know the people who are the the uh, the romanticizers of the genre who will be like, oh, y'all just don't understand the music. I was like, nah, bro, I, no, you ain't gonna rock that. I don't understand the music with me. 
I was banging this stuff before most of these kids even knew what it was. And, uh, or it's like, oh, you're just old or this and that. And I'm not saying, listen, there's, there's lots of hip hop that I like that is very good. It's, it, it is a legitimate art form. There's no question about it. But I think that. Oh, shit. Amongst many people. Uh oh. Session. There we go. With you know, the Black Power movement in the, in the 60s and whatnot, who wanted to feel that sense of participation, who really believe, listen, this scholarship, you can go in JSTOR, there are articles about this, about the revolutionary nature, of, I mean, Torre is being coy, but he knows that there is a cottage industry a lot. of, of yeah. academics who have been pushing this narrative about hip hop being the revolution for 30 years. So I just saw, and I'll butcher this, but I just happened upon a GQ cover of Megan The Stallion uh, that celebrated Megan The Stallion as um, a champion of female empowerment. And I just could not help but think sure. of Key and Peele. And it's a very specific <laughs> Key and Peele bit. Uh, was it Lady Majesty or something like that? Yes. <laughs> It, it's I, I, uh, five years ago. I was standing outside of the studio uh, that I've lived in for a while, and I'm finally leaving. And we were talking about rappers because rappers come in and fucking out. I see rappers so goddamn much. You have no idea how much rap I see. Rented cars, I see. Fake jewels, I see. The best shit ever. I had to walk into a room to hand somebody something to fix a PA system, and a motherfucker was doing snow angels and money. I've seen wow. the most ridiculous shit you can imagine. And a friend looked over at me, and he said, doesn't hip hop nowadays look like a living color skit from the nineties? <laughs> Hurt my soul to laugh, but it does. And what are you going to tell these kids? But you could see it coming. I mean, I stopped. Uh, one of the reasons that I don't feel like an old fuddy duddy is because I felt like that guy when I was 23 or 24. I mean, I, I basically stopped listening to lyrics uh in 1994 95 right i was mm -hmm. pretty much done and um enjoyed it most maybe at the club with a shot of tequila and a couple of heinekens in that era which i don't <laughs> drink now I, I moved on to to belgian beers but anyway um so you could see the trajectory that the genre was on particularly after after the crossover. And I, I don't want to romanticize it when it was mainly something that you just hear on WBLS or whatever in New York. Um, actually, did BLS play rap? Oh, One no, of those. KTU. KTU. There you go. The, yeah. The station in New York. Not to regionally exclude you, uh, brother. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I, I think, I don't know if we, Tori, talked about it on there, but I did a, a tour with the kids' TV show, and Biz Marquis was on there. With, okay. uh, with DJ uh, Cool V, his his cousin, and they often had um, these very very regional and old school hip hop conversations. <laughs> like they got in a fight in catering one day on what was the second rap album. Oh wow, that's a very good trivia question. Oh, it's, it's, I I still love that man to this day. And, and the last poets don't count, obviously. So. No, I don't think they'd be. Considered. No, it's 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 interesting. I don't think people look at them as like maybe proto hip hop, like it's right. like having like a new metal conversation or a punk yeah. conversation, like who's the first punk band? Like I don't know, I don't, know. I don't care. Well, I mean, the Bismarck E reference I think works for both Pascal and me because uh, unless something's changed, we share a favorite all time all time favorite MCs, uh, which would be Big Daddy Kane. No questions asked. Yeah, they're all they're all still friends, and I definitely got to meet a good number of uh, rappers from my my past on that tour. Because every city somebody would pop up that you didn't know lived there. You're like, oh, where? Mike Jason Jones in Rhode Island. Did you see uh, Biz Marquis' performance on the Chris Rock show? This was like 20 years ago, of course, but mm -hmm. he did a cover of. Um, was he playing that, himself? He he was the musical act. And he did a cover of Elton John's Benny and the Jets. Oh, you mean on the Chris Rock's uh, talk show? Yes. Oh, shit. That is 20 years ago. It was brilliant. 
Um, I am not an Elton John fan, but I am a Bismarcky covers Elton John fan. <laughs> <laughs> Bismarcky had a lot of talent, man. He had some. He had some Definitely. bangers. He, Bismarcky he, had some yeah. bangers. That crew. And by the way, quite a scab. Mm -hmm. Talk about a guy who can DJ a party. He DJ a party when I was in law school. He had the crowd moving, moving. He was that's not what he MC. still. Well, I know he got really. He's really sick. But that's what he right. did. Is that every day we would have off, he would fly out somewhere else and DJ a party. So we'd be like, "Hey, we got a day off. We're all gonna go bowling in fucking Canada." And he's like, "Nah, man, I gotta go fly out and do Diana Ross's birthday." And we're like, "Yeah, he's actually a very good DJ." Okay, but that I mean. Thinking that I don't want people listening to the this show or watching this thing to think that you know I am I'm gonna speak for just myself. I am anti hip hop. I have my feelings about the genre, and I definitely have my feelings about a lot of people in the genre, and I definitely have some strong feelings about the press of the genre. That's why if there's people that I really really appreciate, like Davy D, uh, Justin Hunt, who who was supposed to be said he was gonna come on, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, I really appreciate what those cats do with hip hop and hip hop journalism. That being said, when I read these reviews of these dudes that just mumble the same shit over and over again, that are definitely on some silly shit. And you would think you were reading the review of like the greatest album in the world. That was so poignant. I'm like, this dude just talked about drugs for 35 minutes. That's it. Well, and it, and the star of the show is is like you said, it's not the genre; it's the press of the genre. The press of the genre, which takes mm -hmm. us back to Pascal's point about a longstanding, going back to some pioneering work three decades ago, I would say, and maybe a little more than um, the the insistence that the genre has revolutionary potential, and the the question is, what kind of art form that's packaged for the masses? That that exists to be sold, and 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 of course to be sold to the largest market possible, right? Because you want to profit from it, can have revolutionary potential. Let's say for Black people, mm -hmm. um, irrespective of of the race of the audience, if what's bringing the masses of Black people down is on some level capitalism, right? <laughs> so right, if you like, how do you win with all these capitalists? With that route? Right. And, and 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 isn't that what and, and so to bring it back to the black political class I, is what Pasquale hit on so so well, we have the Biden administration doing that Democratic thing that they do oh so well. And they got, you know, black people in the cabinet and we're supposed to be excited about these black people and they're just black capitalists. And I guess there was a pushback to not have people from the finance sector in the cabinet. And I don't know what black organization came out against that statement. They were like, look, the finance sector is how you niggas get a hit. And we're not going to have y'all <laughs> calling out the finance sector, even if they are some horrible people in the finance sector that are going to be in the cabinet. How could you be surprised that? An institution that's loaded with one percent capitalists that shares probably the largest wealth disparity with the rest of the country is the bastion of racial diversity in America, and where you go to get the most quality black labor you need for the service of the federal government. Wouldn't you guys think that's a natural correlation? That the people, of course, ridiculous. I mean, what you're finding, right, is that the notion of diversity is being used as a, a, a bludgeon against progressives who realize that lobbyists, when they are interfaced with government, work to serve the interests of corporate powers that are not really care about, caring about working people, that are disproportionately black, that because we have an elite tier of, of black and people who are working as compradors in these corporate spaces, who are acting as benefactors of those corporate forces and not of black people, that somehow it's racist. And I've heard this thing, it's racist for people who call themselves progressive to fight against having black lobbyists for telecom corporations working in the Biden administration. I saw that. I saw that. 
and and it was it was an interesting uh the whole thing was interesting. They called it. I it was a little clip I saw with like Brianna Joy Gray and and a few other people, and they called it woke washing. They said is the Democratic Party woke washing the cabinet, and I was like, oh, woke washing. That's an interesting term. No, I mean this is this is. I know we're obviously digressing greatly from the original part of the subject mm -hmm. because you know this is a target rich environment where we're talking about the way in which you know finance works to demobilize black people, whether it's popular culture or not. Yeah. But, you know, there's a continuum here. These things are not totally distant, right? In terms of, you know, I'm sure, for example, when you go to the Congressional Black Caucus's Negro prom that they have every fall in September, you're going to be hearing copious rap songs and hip hop music to your images of like, you know, AT&T and, you know, and, and uh, American Express commercials in the background as well. Like there's a whole kind of continuum here that you're gonna find. You're gonna, you know, cats getting jiggy with it, you know, to to the beat while they like, you know, giving their business cards out at, you know, at the next kind of like, you know, networking function. So all of these things work in a kind of cultural continuum, right? In which no one cares that this stuff is grounding the majority of black folk to powder, but they're getting their flex on, they're getting their resume on, they're getting their business card hustle on, and you know. People who interrogate this, if they're not black, they're called racists, or if they are black, they're called haters. You know, Jared Ball, who's a great left commentator, he's like, hate harder. His argument is like, hate harder. We need to hate more. There's more reason to hate. I mean, my larger point is, is that, you know, talking about these inconsistencies about how race is used by the corporate forces in American society to give cover to an agenda that doesn't work for most black folk in the name of diversity. I mean, I wrote an article in Black and General Report a few years ago about, you know, how thanks to thanks to the Congressional Black Caucus, Remy from House of Cards is real. And if you remember the House of Cards, right? Remy is this like black, like, you know, uh, congressional aide who becomes a lobbyist for like this really horrible company named Sandcorp that is like an environmental wasteland who's doing all kinds of horrible toxic stuff. And he works for like, the, you know, the, the guy who was the congressman at the time, who was the evil, pro, you know, antagonist. And he works intimately with him. Right. And you're watching House of Cards. You're like, wow, this is an evil guy. There can never be anything real like this. And then there was an article that I had fallen on because of my good friend, rest in peace, Bruce Dixon. that talked about how the Congressional Black Caucus since the 80s had given birth to a whole league of black lobbyists who had their own organization called like the Washington, some kind of Washington or black lobbyist group. And these guys expertise was lobbying for the same kind of companies that Remy from Hearts of Cars. So it's like, this was like art imitating life. Like, you know, this organization, the Congressional Black Caucus, which comes to life after the civil rights movement, that's supposed to be like, you know, the moral, the moral compass of the Congress has created this army of Remy's from House of Cards who are working for like, you know, telecoms, the worst, the worst capitalist institutions you can think of. And the article that I wrote talked about how these guys were helping the banking industry get the CBC to agree to deregulate Dodd-Frank at the time. The only Remy well, I know uh, shot Tyra Banks in higher ruling. That was the name of the character. <laughs> yeah, I didn't remember that. Michael Rapport. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. So Brian Anon had a question a while back, but that I think we might oh, want to segue one? to was this one. Yeah, but I, but to get to that, I want to give Pascal a plug by way of I think an article of his that I might have mentioned to you, Jason, in a podcast that I did with you. I mentioned it on. Uh, if not, we talked you. for like four hours. I know, right? So it's hard to say what made for what, me. It's hard to say on air. I don't, on I don't air, remember. Wasn't. Yeah, I don't remember. But Pascal wrote this article, is how I met him, actually. Oh. Um, that was a um, it was a critique of an article that Tony C. Coates had written, I think, in 2013 or something like that. And the Coates article was Beyond the Code of the Streets. Oh, street. That was the name of it. And I happened upon the article late. I had read the article. I'm pretty sure it came out in spring of 2013 or something like that. I read it in the spring of 2015. Um, I was wrapping up an article on the Moynihan Report uh, for a symposium that I had organized and was editing. And I was Googling stuff on the Moynihan Report. 
and um, I found some stuff by Coates. And then I was trying to, I couldn't remember that title. So I Googled some more uh, Coates stuff and I happened upon Beyond the Code of the Streets. And then I happened upon Pascal's critique of it. And when I read Beyond the Code of the Streets, I thought it was horrible. <laughs> it made my job, I thought it, it made my job as a black professional who works with a lot of white liberals who read ton AC codes harder uh, because that article seemed to validate rate. I, this wasn't the official intent, but the, but the claims of the article validated the prejudice that I know some white people have about black people, uh, which is that they presume that within the chest of each black person beats the heart of a thug, no matter what the credentialing or, or for that matter, age of the black person in question, um, there it is. And that's exactly the case that, that Coates was making. That technically wasn't exactly his intent to make my job harder or, or his. But, um, but that was the obvious takeaway, which Pascal's article, don't remember the title of it, explored. Um, and it was danger, a cultural Donny tour Hassey guide, Coates, right? Don Hassey Coates and the danger of the black cultural tour guide. Yeah. Do you want to? Damn, you call him the Black Cultural Tour Guide. I'm putting yeah. links up. I'm putting links up on the screen. I don't know if you guys can see it uh, okay. for for uh, for your Black Agenda Report page. So I would like, writing. I would recommend that we get to Brian's question if we if we do get to it by way of Pascal exploring that article he wrote, which was great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I basically wrote the article right. I read that article. Beyond the Code of the Streets that Coach wrote, wrote, and I was horrified by the piece for the same reason. And um, what horrified me is that Coates doesn't understand why it's racist to believe black people are magical. And it, and, and that's the, the, his whole shtick. I mean, even if you watch the trailer for his his uh, his his new uh, HBO uh, uh, special about his book, you know, his whole thing is that you know. Black people are magical. They're just special and everything. And and what is particularly dangerous about this is that that same kind of argumentation has been used by white racists all the time to basically say, well, you know, you can, you know, you know, black people are they have super spidey sense and powers, so we got to deal with them in a certain way because normal stuff doesn't work for them. But to the larger point, in the court of the streets, he's basically saying that. No matter how much education or pedigree or refinement, whatever you want to say, a black man has, and I think he particularly says black men, yeah. all of them have this inner Biggie Smalls in them that if you get them in the right <laughs> way, they're just going to rise up on you and just like punch you in the face. And the thing that I found so comical about this is that Coates either has been so bereft of interacting with people of different races, he would, he didn't realize, like, you know, there's nothing black about this. This is called hyper-masculinity. And if you ever had white friends who were in the Marine Corps, who played football, who were athletes, who were Navy SEALs, who were cops or firemen, you'd realize they respond the same way. And this isn't some specific sign that black men are magical Negroes. And for you to say that is not only racist, but you'll be the same schmuck who will argue why stop and frisk is so racist and horrible, but in the same breath saying, but still, when you get that brother from Harvard, he might shake you. You know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And if you are, I mean, I think the point that Pascal makes about stop and frisk is the star of the show, but um, it, because obviously, as Pascal said, this narrative licenses stop and frisk. It makes it hard to make the case against it if you're going to argue that we've all got an inner thug in us, right? But if you are a, a you know someone who's a black person, I think man or woman who works in a professional setting, the last thing you want to do is be characterized as the angry black person. And it doesn't take much for you to reach the threshold, right? It doesn't have you don't have to do anything. But isn't um, isn't that Coates's whole thing? Like, do you ever look at and and I I watch Democracy Now in the morning. I fuck y'all if you say anything to me about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and but Amy Goodman's face whenever uh, Tana Hasi Coates goofy ass be on the set, she just <laughs> she look stars all in her yeah. eyes when he because he's because he's big, pin game. 
because she believes Negroes are magical too. I think she does. I think she does. I th- I I feel like you guys have met her in some capacity, and she gave you guys that same starry eye. I met her one time. Did I she don't know if she believed that was magical, but I think she generally kind of. Did you of appear had... like John Coffee? <laughs> no, I mean, don't forget. Listen, let's be honest, right? On the left, and I think it's it's all fair to say that we are familiar with the left, the white, mm-hmm. black, all the forms of the left. Like there is the kind of like Trotskyist trope, like like black people are the vanguard of the revolution. Like there is a kind of ideological posture that some particularly, you know, you know, leftists, white leftists have that believe that, you know, like black people are, you know, storming their barricades ready for revolution. And my position is that it's not to say that black people aren't revolutionary. It's just like there are black people who are revolutionary and there are black people who are reactionary as hell. Just like there are white people who could be revolutionary reaction is reactionary as hell. My position is that black people are human beings. And their humanity shouldn't be denied of them because people have these essentialized tropes of expectation in terms of what they should, can, or expect it to be because it kind of fulfills this fetish obsession of they have of seeing, you know, Negroes and Afros in leather suits saying, you know, black power. Yeah. No, I I agree with that wholeheartedly. There's, there's, and, and it's, and it's funny because when I start looking at voices on the left for the black for black people, there's there's not a lot. Um, I do read Black Agenda Report uh, as as much as I can. Um, I do donate when I have a few bucks. Uh, but there's just like I feel like there's like five colored people that get ran through the leftist cycle, and I can't tell if cats are fighting for that spot or or what like that that acceptance spot like i i like a lot of the stuff brianna joy gray says but she's like queen b for black female leftists right now like god forbid (laughs) somebody say something against her like how do how do we this whole show for me is sorry I have, I have notes. This whole show for me is is my whole goal is like I want to build a stronger left, and I definitely want to get black people up on things that we don't talk about that much. And I'm that's why right I, now. Go ahead, go I ahead. became hip to your show through the episode you did with with Cedric. With Cedric. And and I was saying, where's this guy been all my life? <laughs> <In terms of, laughs> the show, man. And no, I was dead sick because I was like, yo, this, because you know I've been thinking about starting a podcast, and I was like, this guy is doing like. You know, doing what I've always wanted to hear is that like a black left perspective that is not stuck in one of the T-shirts of the black left. When I mean the T-shirt, they're like, oh, I'm a revolutionary nationalist, pan-Africanist, anti-imperialist, socialist, Marxist, Leninist, queer feminist, maximalist, maximilian, quadruple. And I'm like, okay, you're in that T-shirt, you know what I'm saying? Or like, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'm the black Trotskyist. And I'm like, you know. I've been writing from a black left perspective long enough to know all of the various ideological postulates that exist on the left. And very few of them realize how much all of that stuff turns off everybody who doesn't know anything about the, about the left at all. Thank you. And not only that, many of them who are stuck in these ideological t-shirts were unwilling to understand, and I got a lot of heat from this from some of my comrades who might think that I'm not radical enough, why there was value to the the Bernie Sanders movement, maybe not Sanders himself, Mm -hmm. opening an overchin window that I believe that we on the black left should have taken to reintroduce black people Mm -hmm. to their own tradition of radical politics. If we don't want to say radical, let's say anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, anti-sexist, anti-racist, whatever phraseology you want to use, and you know, anti-establishment politics. Mm-hmm. And sadly, I feel that the traditional black left, which is maybe five, the same five voices in the diner that you're mm-hmm. talking about, I don't think that they took up that opportunity as effectively as they did. And it allowed people like Ta-Nehisi Coates, like Joy Ann Reed, like other individuals to categorize left politics as a white 
gentrifying trust yep. fund thing yep. that had nothing to do with black people that I was enraged about because it totally neglected the fact that there's over a century history documented scholarship and testimonial and otherwise of black radical politics in this country that goes well beyond the black panther party in 1966 but, but brother that's why i got I, that's why i get you and so speaking of magical negroes look who just appeared oh, did we lose to right first yeah we uh, did <laughs> Motherfucker just disappeared. He just bloop bloop. You, you can't. Well, you know why? You were, you were talking all that smack about Amy Goodman. I want to get on her show one day, so I had to bounce. <laughs> you ain't never been on. I feel like you've been. On, you haven't been on Amy Goodman's show. Never. But am I, am I mistaking you for another light skinned man that was on somebody show? else? It was somebody else. Damn! I totally said all oh, y'all look alike. <laughs> but well, I want to finish this point before you start. For so you start talking. That's why I try to get y'all on the show because there's certain voice and I'll, I'll keep people's names out of it. There's certain people that didn't want to fuck with me because I didn't have a big enough following. Right. And for y'all to be like, yeah, I'll talk to you. A goofy ass. That's fine. It meant a lot to me. And it means a lot to the people that do check this shit out. Because it is a first time for a lot of people to hear a lot of the stuff you guys are saying. And these perspectives for, for a lot of people, they're not getting. Because when I call this shit nuanced barbershop conversation, if us three were hanging out, and I believe we could, three of us, hang out, and we walked into a barbershop, because Torrey would have to get a haircut. Uh, <laughs> Shots fired! <laughs> we'd be, because I'm bald as shit, we'd be having this conversation in the barbershop. Talking this same shit with people that probably don't normally have this conversation, breaking it down real plain so people could understand. And for me, that's how you build a stronger left. It's not trying to get in with some people because you think, well, I need to get in with them because they got a bigger base and, da -da -da -da, and I get my Patreon and yada, yada, yada. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the black dude with the dashiki and yada, yada. Feel me? No, I mean, listen, man. I, so I, I just want to say that's my way of saying thank you, you guys, for for. Coming I mean, listen. Here. I think that, I mean, I, I, I'm, I came on the show and I became an instant fan of the show. Number one, because I feel that you're very good at what you do. I think that you have the perfect voice for this for your vocation when it comes to this show. Number one, thank you and number, number two, right? Mm -hmm. It is so important for me to see. Uh, black spaces occupying a politics outside of the neoliberal corporate hegemony mm -hmm. and introducing black folks to political economy rooted politics that challenges the general function of the American political economy for black folk and for everyone that are not stuck in many of the ideological tropes of comrades who I love, mm -hmm. who taught me, who are instrumental in teaching me, but who I feel their weddedness to those intellectual positions, let's say revolutionary nationalism, yeah. let's say revolutionary nationalist pan-Africanism, who may be ideologies that I don't particularly have problem, problems with. Mm -hmm. But when I, I know that when you start dropping that hammer on the average layperson, black or otherwise, who is totally alien to that discourse. Mm -hmm. And you're saying like, you know, power to the people and the revolutionary must come now and this and that. They were like, revolution? It's like, you know, you know, you know, can I get some healthcare first? You know what I'm saying? I mean, and I'm not saying yeah. that, you know, I'm not saying that revolution is not important or is not viable or doesn't have its place. But what I'm saying is that there are a large number of people, sadly, who have had no exposure to black left politics, whether mm -hmm. that's simply being a democratic socialist, whether that's being a Marxist Leninist, mm -hmm. whether that's being a revolutionary nationalist, whether that's being an anarchist, whether that's being whatever various manifestation or, or just being a new deal, a more left New Deal liberal, okay? 
the sad reality of the circular firing squad that also exists on the left of ideological purity helps facilitate the lack of ability of introducing people who basically say, yeah, why is it that income inequality has been getting worse for 40 years? My paycheck allows me to buy less. It costs me more to get health care, and it's too expensive for me to send my kid to college. Like the person asking those questions is someone that we should be seeing as a natural audience for our politics. And what we seem, we seem to fail to realize is that most Americans are asking those questions right now. And it's not particularly necessary to hit them with Marx's 18th Brumiere as a response to get them to say, you know what, there is something wrong with status quo politics. It's It's hard. It's hard to do that because my whole thing is and this is why I have you brothers on, because you guys help me figure this shit out, right? I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure this shit out. When I go to my dad's house, who could be watching this show, and I love my dad a lot. He's an awesome man. Poor dude just had a mild stroke. Uh, he's okay. He's crazy as shit. Uh, he's got that picture on his wall of Bob Marley, Barack Obama, <laughs> Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. And I walk in the living I'm like, who the fuck? You just, them is just niggas. Like, why do you, why? Why? And I'm trying to, because we, the moment I walk in the door, my dad wants to talk politics, which is funny. Like, you, you, do, like, to your point, these people are upset about the the way economically things have worked out and i think it gets amplified even worse through the trump microphone because when you just you know he's constantly on cnn or msnbc trump is the bad guy that's making it even worse and it's becoming even more real as he's finally retired right um like how do you get certain messages across to cats that still see Barack Obama as in this pantheon of great black men next to Bob Marley. <laughs> like how do you how do you start without being a douche? Because I was on a I was on a show the other night with with a with a young man and he was just Barack Obama's an ass and I hate him. He's this is that I was like, you know what? I get your point. I'm not a Barack Obama fan, but do you ever watch him speak? Have you ever listened to a Barack Obama speech? He speaks. It sounds like Chris Rock. He speaks real well. But as the presidents that we've had, think about the presidents that we had. And think about right before Barack Obama, you had, you had Bush Jr. Wasn't the greatest orator. And then you shoehorn him with Trump. And maybe, maybe it's just because I'm looking at him through the lens of these just two shitty presidents. But... I see why people love him. I watched that David Letterman interview with him. I get it. Of course, you don't see the kids getting bombed. Of course, you don't see the deportation in the cages. You can't. He's just so goddamn silky smooth with the pimp shit that he talks. So how do we penetrate that pimp shit and kind of show people well, this was kind of the start of these problems? Well, I think the first way, and I've done, I mean, I've, I've written some pretty hard critiques of Obama, uh, and uh, I think the first thing you do, right, is that you engage in a project with people, and I've talked to people, I have many friends, mm -hmm. like that I said, ask them a simple question, do you think it would be valuable to the people who govern American society to have communities that have been traditionally mal-served? by the politics of that society to be invested in supporting because of someone they feel they can empathize with the same politics if implemented by someone else they would find problematic do you think that project could be valuable to people who don't have the best interest of your communities at heart 
I think that when you start approaching the Obama project in those kind of ways, mm -hmm. and you start saying, well, let's look about, let's talk, let's talk basic facts. Do you know that Barack Obama received more Wall Street financing than any president in American history? Do you think that someone who's going to be interested in working class communities would normally be getting that kind of money if they didn't expect him to carry out a certain agenda? And I'm not saying you have to be malicious. Don't you know? Just don't be remotely conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't expect that everyone's going to get it because a lot of them are going to reject it. But I think that if you just start in basic terms, the ones who generally are the people who are inclined to say there's something wrong with the system mm -hmm. may get it. And there are some, a lot of my friends are successful career professional, black and brown folk who have you know six figure jobs. Mm -hmm. They're never gonna get it because the system works for them. And they have no, they're not interested. Some of them might, but most of them have no interest in challenging it. What are you gonna say, Trey? I was going to just amplify Pascal's last point, which is, I think, one of the ways that we hamstring ourselves in connecting with, let's say, black audiences is that those of us who are progressives fall into the trap of trying to connect with the black vote. Right. I mean, we tend to think of black people ourselves as monolithic. Pascal and I don't. You don't. Right. Cedric definitely doesn't. But um, but anyway, that's that's the default. Right. And I think. The fact of the matter is, as Pascal alluded to, that there is, in fact, class heterogeneity among Black Americans. And for some, you know, and, and it's a not insignificant number, um, a class-based politics that's going to benefit 80% of Black Americans, they're allergic to because they're in the top 20%. <laughs> and they don't want to pay the taxes that will go along with that, right? Instead, what they want is federal coffers to come to them to trickle down to the masses, uh, more black entrepreneurialism, let's say, more CEOs who look look like America. Um, and what does that do for anybody who isn't the CEO? I mean, I think I think Pascal and I had versions of the same reaction to Obama going back to 2008 um, in, insofar as neither one of us were fans. So I know that that was clear. Pascal maybe was a was a little less likely to find him charming than Jason or I. But for me, to whatever extent I found him charming, it was that I appreciate the talent, right? I mean, this is one of the, the ways I could appreciate Dr. Umar. I appreciate the talent um, of what he's doing, just as I can appreciate the talent of Rush Limbaugh, right? Um, the content is not something that, that appealed to me, but I definitely appreciate it like Jason, how it is Obama resonated with people, but he resonated with people who, at least among black folk, uh, people who embraced the idea that we shared a common interest. I think a critical part of his post-racial game that's often overlooked, but chapter four of Toward Freedom is in part about this, is the central role played by underclass ideology in bridging the divide, interestingly enough, between what whites meant what attracted white people to Obama's post-racialism uh, and what attracted black people to Obama's shtick. Uh, and what you would find is, particularly among petty bourgeois blacks, but not exclusively because these hood movies there, see I brought us full circle. Mm -hmm. these, these hood movies sold black Americans a, a somewhat sanitized version of underclass ideology. So most of us embrace that stuff. And it was a way for Obama to, oddly enough, demonstrate his cultural authenticity, not just to white listeners uh, who were happy that this black man was willing to talk down to black people, but um, around the globe, but also to black listeners, right? Who understood right or wrong that their cousin Pookie should not be eating Popeyes for breakfast, as Jason and I uh, have talked about before. By the uh, way, Jason, sorry? I have to, oh, yeah, you can't you hear me. You no, no, no. I don't have to go. But I uh -huh. wanted to mention something to you. Since I don't like turkey and we talked uh -huh. about Popeyes, I'm having Popeyes for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Popeyes, you, 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 just just remember chicken, the only chicken. Popeyes buffet, Lafayette, Louisiana, the most magical there, place on earth. There used to Fuck be a Popeyes now. buffet mm -hmm. on in New Orleans on Carrollton at Canal. It was one of the few that Copeland himself still owned. 
And I used to hit that spot with my cousin Kim, who Pascal is friends with, uh, when just Magical after I graduated. Place. Damn right. I mean, I, I don't place. even know. I guess that I just didn't eat anything the rest of the day. Right? It just, How could you? Right. I saved a, myself. Oh, man. I shit. I do some stereotypical shit and eating that Popeye is one of them and do that shit with a motherfucking smile. I feel that we, I'm glad we all feel comfortable in our blackness to outline <laughs> like fried chicken, man. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it's delicious. I'm sorry. Well, this is it. It's actually a dig at Obama. So you, yes. uh, you, you should. Uh, uh, Popeye's is OK. Uh, I love it. Uh, folks. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Uh, I shoot these threes. <laughs> Fuck these hoes. <laughs> I, I have to play this clip because uh, I have to. I have to. Oh, from the Boondocks. I have to. I have to. Sorry. Which season? Well, we'll this find is, out. <laughs> I think this is season one. Okay. Hey, man. She gonna be crying like this all the time? Because I say if she is, we kick her out. Shh. Everybody, shush, shush. President Obama's talking. My I know he's America. gonna tell us what to do. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to start off by thanking all of you out there uh, who have called and written letters about the safety of the first family. You'll be happy to know that Michelle, Sasha, Malia, myself, and Bo are all fine. Don't nobody care about you, man. Tell us everything will be okay for us. Everything is going to be okay for us. We are currently in our very own super secret <laughs> underground bunker with enough food and water and entertainment to last several lifetimes. But I'm here tonight to talk about you. In times of crisis, Americans pull together. And what's going to get us through this difficult time? Sharing. Sharing? Lending a helping hand to a neighbor in their hour of need. No a neighbor. What we need is a cure. Unfortunately, there is no cure for the pandemic we now face. But we do have an even more powerful weapon. Compassion for our fellow man. No! <laughs> compassion for our fellow man! In conclusion, I want to say that we are all in for some tough times ahead. And when I say we, I mean you. But Michelle, Sasha, Malia, myself, and Bo are going to be right here, rooting for you all the way. Good night, and God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. We all go to die. I had to, I had to play that clip because I was working on this piece. Uh, I, I do try to write. So you guys are also like my inspiration to try to, to string a few words together. And... Uh, I've watched a clip of Obama. It came up on my my YouTube feed somehow. Uh, the algorithm was fucking with me. And it was a clip of Obama answering a question in 2016 when he was still president at a press conference. And it was an 11-minute answer. And watching him answer that question, he starts it off. I forget what the question was even about. And watching him answer the question, he's like, uh, you guys know me. I got my start organizing in the streets and he goes on to talk about gerrymandering he goes on to talk about the democratic party's failures he goes on to talk about voter suppression and the way to solve it all you gotta vote that was it you can't talk about the state of the country if you're not involved so you gotta vote and I was like, what, like, I was blown away by the answer, but the way he got there, I'm like, this is why cats love you, because you are pretty much what Aaron Sorkin just sits there and is like, oh, and he, and he writes all that bullshit about, because it's exactly what it sounded like. It sounded like just a West Wing threw up. And I'm like, this is why motherfuckers love you. And that a boondocks clip to me is it just encapsulates that, right? Like, hey, I'm gonna tell you, but you know, it's satire, but he would always say it in such a nice way. You're fucked. Well, I mean, listen, the Obama project was created in a Robert Rubin lab petri dish anyway. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not as I'm not. I mean, I'm, I understand you guys giving kudos, but I've had it, man. This is a manufactured cat, man. This, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not going to give this cat that much love for his ability to manipulate people's emotions. I mean, this is a dude who has been in the star chamber for over 25 years. I mean, Torre's dad wrote about him in 96, like, alert, alert, black left. This is what we need to be aware of. You know, the, he. this is what, literally talking about the guy as if, 
there was a ruling class laboratory and they were putting, you know, the cells together to manufacture this. Dude. But he's dropping so, threes on these hoes. Yeah, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you should tell your dad that to Ray. Be like, yeah, you know, that's a great piece. It was very insightful. But uh, you forgot that he was totally dropping threes on these hoes. <laughs> I mean, I probably won't I, I, relay that, but <laughs> <laughs> I think he'd appreciate it just the same. <laughs> like watching that clip of Barack Obama shoot that three, I was like, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess it's because I, you know, for me, you know, my baby, my favorite line about Obama is the fact that his whole first term cabinet was chosen by a Citibank executive. Yeah, you know, so to me, like, you know. The, the mythology is beyond gone, you know. I, I you know, I, I'm not enticed. I mean, I do agree that he has certain political skills. There's certain, there's certain raw talent. He's probably the most talented politician we've had in America going back. I would say maybe to to, to Kennedy. I think he's. I think yeah. Reagan had certain talent, but I think Obama, because of his youth, you know, he has certain gifts. Not only personally, but the, the attractive wife, the two girls, you know, the, the exotic background, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's a very marketable, politically marketable package that I would not de de deny. But I don't think it's, it is, you don't have to be a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist to understand why after the greatest evisceration of capital since 1929, the American ruling class realized to neutralize public discontent, you put a charming black family with this, this tall, attractive black man in the White House to have everyone cheer like we have overcome. I mean, it's it's perfect. It's like it's like the master chess. Test, test play. But he he's perfect to project a lot of shit on, too. And Torre talks about that in Towards Freedom, where it's like, well, he's got a single parent household. It's like, but his single parent wasn't like my motherfucking single parent household. That shit was different as fuck. Motherfucker lived in Indonesia with his uh, fucking, what did his stepdaddy do? He was something for the, was it the CIA? Some state, the state department. department. Stuff. <laughs> and, his, and, his, and his regular daddy... Uh, <laughs> He was like some kind of professor. Oh, like he didn't have all oh, 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 Cold War State Department assets. Like type. his <laughs> whole life was on some like next level, super light skin yeah, shit. Well, yeah, like I'm not have her. nobody I knew had that single mama life. Yeah. Nobody. Expensive Hawaiian yeah, yeah. prep schools. Right. Yeah. Motherfuckers act like Barack Obama at. <laughs> Like just because he listens to Jay Z, like that was like the thing. Like, oh well, Barack Obama is—he's from the streets, but he's smart. To to your point about fucking uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and and the Harvard I mean, guy. Okay, I'm gonna be very honest, right? I mean, I, I, I want us to be candid, right? Like, As it, fuck, it, candid. It it is such a transparent demonstration of how shallow a society we are, in my opinion, that Barack Obama is seen as exceptional. You know, I've known vapid careerist Ivy League Negroes my whole life. They are a dime a dozen. I don't understand why people are so impressed with this guy. <laughs> if them cats you knew couldn't hit a turnaround jumper from the perimeter, and dime and and bag a dime, and then have two kids with good hair. That's why. Good hair. Well, I mean, you know, I can't. If, if they had been in the pocket with people like you know Michael Froman and Robert Rubin from like the time they were first year in law school, then maybe they would have had all those. Get you know, and also played you know <laughs> basketball in high school and all that stuff, and you know. And what, what, I mean, what this else? A, this is a contrived cat. The, yeah. the cat is contrived. The like all jokes aside, I'm gonna stop fucking with you. Pop my collar, <laughs> dust your shoulder. That was that was when he won, right? Didn't he do oh. this when he won? Yeah, you know, the, the guy was born in 1961, right? He went mm -hmm. to high school in Hawaii. He's not even culturally attenuated to hip hop, he's a disco guy. I mean, the fact that this dude is fronting like he's down with like hip hop 
from Hawaii? What were you listening to? Like, you know, when DMC hits the beach? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> but Pascal, to, to your point of, of him having a contrived persona, perhaps that's his genius. His genius is, and, and I think he discusses this in one of his first two memoirs, that he focused on, you know, crafting this persona from a pretty early age, right? I mean, and not, I, I think a lot of black Ivy Leaguers didn't, you know, didn't anticipate that they could be president. So they didn't no, that's true. craft that's the persona yeah. that one needs to craft at a very early age, you like know, he did. Common and Kanye in the White House, man. Common and Kanye you know, in the White House. Having the for, having the foreign services agent, white mom, and, you know, <laughs> Or State Department related family might give him a little trajectory on being a ruling class pawn that most folks would not have. I get that. Right? I understand. It, that. It's, mean, it's funny because <laughs> it's funny because when we, when we think back at the Obama years and we, we laugh, like, I'm, I'm bull, I'm fucking, you know, I'm fucking with you about three pointer. Like, <laughs> we laugh at this shit. And then it just, it eight years of that bullshit, right? And then you get eight more. It's just a different kind of a lie. Donald Trump's born into wealth, crazy wealth, kind of been a habitual fuck up his whole life. But because he was on TV for 15 years in everybody's house, playing, pretending to be, I think it was a non gear to DOS that said, Donald Trump is a poor man's version of what a rich man is. With with no. better hip hop on a few days than Obama. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Because Donald Trump used to hang with Russell Simmons, and they were making hip hop songs about Donald Trump. They wasn't making no hip hop songs about Obama. <laughs> no, no, not really. <laughs> that would not have been a hit that I can think of. <laughs> but because 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 again, he didn't do the wrong. He wasn't. You know, dropping bombs like Vietnam, if you will, even though he was. Even though he was. No one ever associated that because we always associated him with this 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 vision of black excellence. Um, and going back to those movies, it's so funny how uh I think it was Pasquale. <laughs> When he was talking about you, when you, the the revolutionary black guy who's revolutionary all the time, and I had a minister society clip queued up of uh, of the one guy that was supposed to be like the woke friend, mm -hmm. and he was in the nation, and right. it was that that's what woke was to me. I don't know if it was. I'm sure it was similar for you guys. In that era, woke was like the one friend that like read a final call and was like, yeah, like. And then the kid, the one kid in Menace is like he's constantly yelling at them guys to stop drinking and live. And the the, the devil's got a plan, and they're falling into the devil's plan, and no one I mean, wanted to listen, fucking yeah, hear it. I listened to a lot of KRS One when I was in college. I understand. I get the. I know mm. the the whole. I mean that in our in our era, right? The whole African medallions, Afro, you know, reading Shake On to Diop, you know, the African origins of civilization, kind of like you know. Before Hoteps had all this kind of pejorative, uh oh, uh, you know, uh, uh oh, you lose me. Oh, yeah, uh, the, our host is frozen. Oh, Jason, is we all, we, that's a problem. Yeah, so I guess I guess he needs to get <laughs> he's a host, man. We we can't afford to have him go. No. Well, you could probably keep talking. Well, the larger point I was going to make back. Ray, was, was that, you know, you or I are old enough to remember where there was a kind of return to a kind of black cultural nationalism that was being celebrated in hip hop and in some of the literature that a lot of folks were circulating at the time when we were kind of in our college kind of era. So I can identify with what he was talking about. But the thing is, though, right? you come to a certain point where you interrogate the politics of that and you start to question what the, what does that political project lead to eventually? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was retrograde when we were in college too, which is <laughs> the first <laughs> tell. Um, I mean, it wasn't as retrograde then as it is now, but um, 
you know, more people should have interrogated it, but I think it dovetailed pretty, pretty seamlessly, or at least would with Reaganism and the sister soldier clip that Jason showed uh, previously, I think highlighted that uh, Bill right. Clinton's contempt for her notwithstanding uh, on some level, the case that she made, I just got a text from Jason. Um, he has no idea what happened, but, but, you know, as we talked about before, the, the case that she made was Booker Bookerism, uh, right. with the addendum that white people suck. Right. So, right. Exactly. And, you know, part of, you know, part of, you know, the, when we're talking about exposing people and not just black people, particularly black people to a kind of progressive or left politics, right. Is that I think that, you know, coming from the tradition that you come from personally, intellectually, as well as your family, is that the understanding of black political thought historically and the challenges of a project that complicates the nationalist narrative that has become so dominant and commonplace, particularly with millennial youth, unfortunately, through the proliferation of social media and how you know, challenging that politics and that worldview will get you deemed as, oh, you know, you know, racially disloyal, so on and so forth. And when, when we realize that that's not the point of the project, the point of the project is to interrogate where exactly, what is the logical conclusion of this kind of race reductionist politics in terms of what it produces, where it gets you, and what has why does it become constantly get recycled as the only option that many black people are presented as a way to solve their problems? Well, you remember um, around the Million Man March, so it was that October of 1995, uh, Farrakhan had a moment of near respectability. And I remember watching the McLaughlin group right after the Million Man March and Eleanor Clift, who I think was the liberal on that show in that era, had given Farrakhan uh, qualified praise. Now, again, it was greatly qualified because the anti-Semitism precluded actually celebrating him. But what she praised Farrakhan for and, and praised the march for was getting black men, taking, taking steps to get black men to finally recognize that they bore responsibility for the problems that afflicted their own communities. And I used to watch the McLaughlin group, obviously. It was on Sunday as I lived in New York, and I didn't have cable. So uh, I watched what I could watch um, and was always intrigued by by the show, especially years earlier when Pat Buchanan was on, because that, that had a, a, a chilling, uh, an even more chilling, um, uh, he was a more chilling presence. But anyway, um, that was, I thought, quite the tell about, you know, the Million Man March and its resonance, but also a window onto the conservatism of the moment, uh, because people had finally picked up liberals, had picked up on the fundamental conservatism of the NOI of that era, uh, which was masked, with, you know, the Bookerite uh, you know, elements right. of it, which right. rather than simply focusing on the white people suck part uh, and the anti-Semitism, right? Um, and it, for a minute, I mean, some people imagined that if the NOI could shed itself of the the white people suck part and the anti-Semitism, that it might have actually gained true legitimacy. But again, I mean, the, the, the basic point is that um, you could see from Farrakhan's sudden mainstreaming in that era, the ways in which this black nationalist discourse actually dovetailed with Reaganism. Right. No, this is this is a very, very like important kind of subject, kind of sub part of this larger conversation we're having about these films that came about in the early nineties, these kind of hip hop culture.